Welcome to the daily Glasgow Cappuccino. Start each day of COP26 by drinking in a few minutes of warm, stimulating conversation about climate resilience. I'm your host, Peter Willis from The Resilience Shift. Shall we begin? My guest on this morning's Cappuccino is Dr. Deborah Roberts. Deborah is the head of sustainable and resilient initiatives at the Etiquini municipality, which centers on the port city of Durban in South Africa. She's also co-chair of the IPCC's working group two, which focuses on impacts of and adaptation to the effects of climate change. She's the first IPCC co-chair to be both a scientist, a doctorate is in urban biogeography, and a practicing local government official. She's been in local government since 1994. Very nice to have you with me. How are you? Very well, Peter. Good. So, Deborah, um, you and I have had many conversations uh, during this year about climate change leadership and so on. And I know that you have some skepticism about the pursuit of resilience as a thing in itself, and you are an expert in this uh, in many people's eyes and so on. But your thinking is very interesting. And um, my sense is that you you see the potential in the sort of the resilience, the urge towards resilience as lying in characteristics of a system like your city or of individual leaders that give us a chance of being a little more resilient to shocks that are going to come from climate change. If I've got you right, can we start with the big system characteristics? What do you look for in your work in the city that can build towards, what are the building blocks of a more resilient response than a less resilient response to the shocks up ahead? A very interesting question, which has any number of of potential answers. But I think the usefulness of a concept like resilience is not because it sheds any particular light on a particular problem and gives us a definitive answer, but because it is more nebulous, it forces us to ask many more questions than we have answers to. And so if we think about resilience really as a process, um, a journey that we take rather than as an end goal, because as you say, I am cynical and I don't believe given the current challenges we face in Durban or even at a global level, that there will be a point at which we can stand side by side and say we are now resilient to the shocks and stresses. I think there are a number of of critical building blocks for a local government such as the one that I work for. I think the the first thing um, that would be important because knowledge is absolutely fundamental during this time of unpredictable shocks and stresses that we have to harvest that knowledge. And I think local governments often are not well set up to have knowledge partnerships. The most obvious being, for example, with their tertiary institutions, the ability to constantly link from local government to those tertiary institutions, be informed by the most recent findings in the social, physical and natural sciences, I think is a fundamental element of surviving the 21st century. I also think we underscore the various different forms of knowledges that local government itself produces, and we don't harvest that institutional memory. And so it becomes a bit like a game of monopoly. You go back to the beginning and you don't collect 200 rand or 200 pounds, given the audience for for this podcast. And so a lot of knowledge within local government itself is lost. And I believe that looking at our past is going to be a key informant in building an understanding of where we might go in the future. I also think we need to be more respectful of the knowledge we have in civil society. I think we've got to look um, at plumbing local knowledge and indigenous knowledge for the insights they have to offer. And that speaks to a very different form of governance. If you're talking to, you know, your tertiary institutions, you are being quite determined about harvesting your own knowledge uh, from the work that you do, and you're looking to alternative forms of knowledge, such as local knowledge and indigenous knowledge. I think that first respecting of knowledge, collecting knowledge, um, curating that knowledge is, is an important element. But that speaks to a much more accessible form of governance. 
And I think that means that local government in the 21st century is going to have to open up. It's no longer a creature of procedures, policies, laws, but I think we need a much more round table approach where we welcome different people to the table to talk with political leadership where those different views have the same kind of power um, as we might see in the current political decision-making processes. I also think it means acknowledging at the local government level that development as we knew it may not hold the answer to where we go in the future. And I think being open to a paradigm shift, you know, instead of thinking, for example, about GDP and economic growth, local governments that prepared to talk about degrowth, uh, a well-being economy, circular economies, who are prepared to test those boundaries um, would be very important. I think in the context of an African city like ours, where people are literally building the city uh, by uh, voting with their feet in a way, by creating informal settlements, indicates that the past development path is, is not one that suits people, doesn't allow access. And so I think about alternative uh, modes of urbanization, instead of thinking about informality as something that we are going to erase from the urban landscape through formalization, what role does informality play? Does it allow access in a way that we can't do with traditional development paths? How do we welcome those communities to, to the table to develop a, a different narrative? And so to me, the key building blocks of, of resilience are awareness, uh, harvesting mining knowledge, both present and future of different forms, of being open to hearing very different stories, balancing out the power so that not all power is vested in political structures, but there are other people at the table who can take decisions of, about the city. And then opening ourselves up to the fact that we may need to create futures that have very few links to, to the current development uh, present that, that we're in and being prepared to ask those questions. But this all requires people to have enormous courage. And I think that's going to be the hallmark of resilience is a society that's brave enough to say, we're not going to get on top of many of these problems. We will have to stand together and we will have to bravely ask questions of both ourselves and our government and, and the way we see our futures. And I think that's disquieting. So I think people who are brave and can live with a reasonable level of, of discomfort again, would be a key part of, of building this resilience. Fascinating, Deborah. And I recall that you and I have spoken more than once about the, the, the fact that it is the poorest of the poor who, by definition, and by the mere fact that they have survived um, as far as they have, are more resilient by, by habit and by circumstance than people who um, have lead middle-class existences and work in structured um, organizations and so on. And what I'm hearing you say is that that the organs of government in the world we're entering into are going to have to become much more fluid, courageous. Again, it seems to me that it's the poorest of the poor whose courage is absolutely required on a daily basis uh, to simply find a way to get through. Um, how do how do you see those two worlds um, coming together, blending? Is that even a, a thought? Well, I, I think the first thing we we need to be careful we're we're not romanticizing poverty or, or informality, but I think the reality is that there are many people, and for example, in Durban we have just under six hundred informal settlements who are walking the future before we get there in the sense that they're already dealing in the present with an existence where it's hard to know what tomorrow will bring uh, in terms of your livelihood, in terms of your health, in terms of your well-being, in terms of, of security. So in many ways, um, the people who live those existences are time travelers. They, they're giving us a view into a world that is going to become much more common, I believe, than we would like to, to believe currently. Um, and they are showing remarkable resilience of showing how if under a set of circumstances you walk into a city and you can't find a place that is either cost effective for you or allows you easy access to jobs 
or services that you can afford, you will have the ingenuity to create a niche that allows you access to those things. And I'm not saying that that uh, provides a life that is at all um, indicated to be, you know, a life that is one of well-being and so on. But it, it does show the human uh, ingenuity when put to to the test. And so I think there are very many lessons to be learned. And I think instead of looking to those communities as something that is a blip on the bell curve, and that's something, you know, that is the tail end of our bell curve and that we need to be rid of to bring everything back to formality. I think thinking about social safety nets, so acknowledging that people are building a city within a city and, and helping that process so that we do move towards a development path where those choices are at least backed by social safety nets that help maximize health and well-being and outcome and equity, where those choices have to be made out of sheer necessity. And I think that's an important change in, in mindset, but also allowing those people a not only access to social safety nets, but access to power about decisions. You know, very often decisions about these communities are taken in city halls without talking to those communities. And those communities exist for a reason. Um, and so that engagement, I think, of allowing people in, allowing access, and that's not a simple thing to do within current systems. Just think about the simple mechanics of holding a community meeting. Very often for our middle class communities, we can safely choose a venue um, and people can come uh, to an evening meeting because they have a facility of private transport, uh, they live in the area, but with many of these communities, for example, that's simply not possible. You can't hold um, a, a meeting in the evening because of the, the problem that's created by lack of transport, um, safety issues and so on. So it gets down to real nitty gritty logistics in, in some instances that we ha have to think about our access. So many meetings during the daytime just make no sense for people who are working full time and don't have the ability to take time off work. So it talks about a different form of, of governance where we, we need to move that governance to the people, we, we need to potentially be going to those communities ourselves, which kind of upends our view of the, the political hierarchy and, and who's the decision maker um, in the city. And, and these are all untested modalities. You know, there, there have been local governments, for example, um, in South America who have community-based budgeting where the poor and the rich equally sit at the table and decide what the priorities are, are for communities. But it's very time intensive and it's, it's quite different. It requires different modalities in terms of law and legislation. And these all create discomfort and quiet because the one thing we don't like as, as humanity is change. And all of these things, so all of the um, knobs we have to turn on the, the dashboard that is the 21st century all suggest that we have to reset the system in a way that change is the constant uh, in, in our lives. Because if our very natural environment around us, um, the physical setting we find ourselves in is, is in this constant flux because we're no, not showing uh, sufficient signs of, of ambitious action, then we ourselves need to be able to respond to that by changing our social and, and economic systems. And that generates enormous decline. Well, there's a menu for our next generation. Uh, thank you. <laughs> what, a, uh, what a fascinating picture you're painting, uh, Deborah. Um, uh, the coffee is finished. Um, the dregs are at the bottom of the cup now, so our time is up. But thank you so much for your um, thoughtful responses and your wisdom. <laughs> And uh, I wish you all the very, very best in everything you're doing there in Durban. Great talking to you as always, Peter. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.